monsters of this size. More of these colossal abominations walking below the water surface. I shiver at the thought. And I keep shivering in the cold. I've never enjoyed our voyages out to the cold waters of the Drake Passage, but it is the best way to Antarctica. And that means it's the best way for us to take the pictures we need of the frozen continent. Half of the crew on board are there for research opportunities at the bottom of the world, while others, like myself, are there to take pictures that so many other photographers would never even try to take. Some of the best photographs ever taken are pictures of places where there aren't usually many cameras. People can have their endless pictures of city skylines, grassy fields, or crowded mountaintops. I prefer to capture the image of a place where most people will never get a chance to see otherwise. Plus, there are penguins. Everyone loves pictures of penguins. I put my camera in front of my eyes. Most of what I see is through my lens. I take some snapshots of the water. The Drake Passage is as turbulent and rocky as ever. I've never had a calm journey across it. It's not always easy to get a good shot when the deck is constantly rocking back and forth. I usually have to sift through plenty of unfocused, blurry messes before I find a picture that I like. I can't wait until we find some land. I will gladly take the frozen tundra over the choppy, chilly waters of the Drake Passage any day. Soon enough, I'll be able to get my feet on some solid ground, find some penguins to model for me, and then have a break from the harsh patch of ocean. Will you just take a good picture already? My brother David said beside me. Our shared passion for photography in exotic places has taken us all over the world together. It's actually been pretty wonderful. I think the world has enough pictures of just an open, empty ocean, don't you think? Something catches my eye through my camera lens, something out in the water. The ocean stretches out into a gray horizon, but a silhouette is in the middle of my shot, standing upright out in the sea. I lower my camera, just to make sure it's not a smudge on the lens that I'm seeing. The shape is still out there in the distance. I point to it. What is that? David scoffs beside me. What's what? I want him to follow my finger and to see what I'm seeing out in the ocean. When he looks, though, he just seems confused. He apparently doesn't see it. I raise my camera again and zoom in, hoping to get a better look at whatever is out there and to maybe even get a picture of it. I adjust the perspective and get a better look at whatever is out in the distance. I almost drop the camera overboard when I get a clear image. It's a little boy. He's probably around six years old, but I've never been good at determining ages. He's dressed in old fashioned clothes, the kind that kids wouldn't ever want to be seen in nowadays. He's sopping wet from head to toe and his skin is a pale blue his eyes bloodshot, and his face puffy and swollen. He's covered in frost, some of his skin blackened from the cold, and small icicles poke through his clothes. When the boy and I lock eyes, he grins at me with a rotting black smile. My brain can't wrap my head around the sight of him standing almost weightlessly on the surface of the water. His body doesn't drop. He doesn't sink and slip beneath the waterline. He's standing there as if the ocean was solid ground, Maybe it's frozen. Maybe he's standing on ice, but the water doesn't look like it's solidified. No, it really seems like he's just casually standing on top of the raging seas of the Drake Passage. What are you talking about? David asks, still trying to follow my gaze. I wave my hand around, still pointing directly at the soaking wet child. The boy out in the ocean shouldn't be hard to miss. He's the only person in the area that isn't on board the ship. I'm talking about that. David looks again. He squints for a few seconds, but he clearly isn't looking at anything. Definitely not at what I'm seeing. He shakes his head. There's nothing out there, he scoffs. I knew it was only a matter of time before you lost your mind on one of these trips. I think they call that cabin fever. Just look, all right? Look right over there. I try one last time to get him to follow where I'm pointing. He still can't see it. I raise my camera and take a picture of it. This will be my proof, my evidence that I am not losing my mind out here. He'll see, and then I'll show the whole world this insane sight. 
What are you doing? David asks. What I'm supposed to do, right? Capturing the moment? Then maybe you'll take all of this seriously. I take you seriously, he says. I just don't see what you're seeing. You will. I'm more frantic and loud than I might need to be, but I feel crazy. I need him to know that I'm not. I need to know that I'm not. Some of the crew gather around me from all the commotion I'm making. They don't seem to notice the boy standing overboard either. Most of them are hardened sailors, the kind of people that aren't easily intimidated or spooked. But what I'm going to show them will change that. They'll all see. What's all the racket about? The ship's captain, Hamish, asks David. It's not like the two of you to be this loud. My brother saw something interesting, David says, trying to be supportive despite his own skepticism. He nudges me in the side. Go on, show them. What he really means is, show me, because he wants me to prove it to him too. I click the buttons on my camera to pull up the image that I just captured. It comes up on the screen, but the boy in the photo isn't just standing there. He's pointing right at the camera. He's pointing right at us. I don't get a chance to show them the photo. Hamish stumbles backward, holding his chest. Suddenly, a long, thin shard of ice erupts from his torso, stained with his blood. Seconds later, another large red icicle skewers him from within, stabbing out of his shoulder, right near his heart. He opens his mouth, but a scream doesn't come out. Instead, a large, sharp pillar of ice erupts from down his throat. We all back away. No one on board has ever seen anything like it, and no one knows what to do. Hamish kneels over, but his body is propped up by the pillar of ice jetting from his mouth that's now freezing to the deck. When I get a closer look at the ice, I see that there are things frozen within, internal organs. I think I see his heart deep in the glaze. I turn back to the frigid waters. The figure is still standing there on the surface. He's still smiling at me. He raises his hand and extends his index finger, but again, he doesn't point at me. He points at one of the deckhands, Harold, who is still standing beside me, completely unaware of what I'm seeing. The moment the boy's finger points at him, Harold lets out a gasp of cold air, his breath visibly spilling out of his airways. He claws at his stomach and, this time, we all clear away immediately. We know what's coming. It's just like Hamish. No ice pillars burst from Harold's mouth, though. Instead, it finds other places to emerge from. Icicles split him open, tearing through his flesh before he even has a chance to scream. There were more smaller blades of ice this time, like he's being riddled with knives before collapsing onto the deck. His blood starts to freeze, even as it's still pooling around him. What's happening? Someone yells. It's the kid! I yell, desperately motioning toward the starboard side of the ship. I flail my arms around, pointing right at him again. It's him! Right there! People follow my instructions and look out to the sea, but their confusion is palpable. Nobody else sees him, but he's right there. I point right at him, and then the boy points back. Again, he points to a person near me. The sailor next to me starts to freeze in front of my eyes. Frost spreads across his whole body in seconds, and then he suddenly shatters to pieces. Frozen fragments of his body fly through the air. Some even hit me as he falls apart. More and more sailors start to freeze or break apart into icy chunks in front of me. The boy keeps pointing at different people, choosing which one is going to die next. One by one, a terrible force takes hold of them and extinguishes any bit of warmth in their bodies until they are just cold corpses on the deck. David takes hold of me and tries to pull me back away from the railing. I hear him letting out a slew of profanities. I've never seen my brother look so scared. What the hell is this? He asks, his teeth chattering from sheer terror. What is this? It's him! I keep pointing right at the boy, but that's not good enough. I raise the back of the camera and show it to David, so he can finally see. This! David looks down at the screen, right at the boy pointing to the camera. He stares at it for a second, and then looks at me with wide, terrified eyes. There's nothing there. It's just the sea. I look at the photo on the screen. The boy is still there in the picture. He's still pointing right at me, directly into the camera lens. Why does no one else see him? I have photographic evidence and he still can't be seen. It's not possible. None of this is. David, come on, just look. I am looking. There's nothing there, nobody. 
You have to believe me! I want to, all right, he says, still panicked from everything happening around us. There's obviously something going on here. I see that much. You think it's connected to the kid you're seeing? It is. I need him to understand. He's doing this to us, to all of us. David buries his head in his hands, like he's trying to wake himself up or somehow wish all of this away. How? He asks. How is he doing it? Why? I shake my head. I don't have a good answer for him. It's clear now that this is not just some boy. This is a force of nature. Some violent thing out here where no humans should be. I want to comfort my brother. I want to tell him that it's going to be okay, but those words don't leave my mouth. I can't even start to form them through my chattering teeth. Telling him that we are going to be okay feels like a lie, because all evidence seems to point to the contrary. Still, I want to help him more than anything. I want to give him some little bit of warmth in all of this cold. David! He doesn't respond. He doesn't blink. My brother just stands there, and then doesn't move at all. And he won't ever again. He's suddenly frozen solid in front of me. He's like a statue, a perfect image of him that's no longer living. He's like the photographs I take, a moment frozen in time. No! Tears turn to shards of ice on my cheeks. I almost grab hold of my brother, but I'm scared that he'll break into pieces if I do. David keeps staring right at me. He doesn't blink. He never blinks. I look around and the whole ship is silent. The screams have frozen, just like the people have. There is nothing but icy death everywhere I turn. The only person that moves is the little boy out in the Drake Passage. He's walking toward me now, effortlessly striding across the rapid currents of the dark sea. I fall to my knees. I don't know what else to do. There's nowhere to run, and I can't stop him from coming. I wait for his arrival. He steps up onto the deck without a word, coming right toward me. He looks as frozen as David, but it doesn't seem to impede his movement. He grins with those frost-bitten lips as he gets closer and closer. I don't know what to do. Maybe there's nothing that I can do. The boy stops a few paces from me, standing amidst all of the chilling carnage that he's unleashed. He doesn't seem to mind all of the frozen, broken, shattered, and bloody corpses around him. All of that death is his own doing and he seems very happy about it. I don't know if I can reason with him, but at least I try to talk to him. It's the only idea that I have left. If he's going to kill me like he did all of these other people, why are you doing this? He doesn't say anything. He just keeps smiling at me. He raises his little hand and then points at me. There's no mistaking it this time. He's not pointing at anyone else. He's finally regarding me and only me because there is no one left. I wait for the cold, for the gruesome end of my life, but I refuse to just sit there and let him kill me. There had to be a reason that I could see him and no one else could. Why are you doing this to me? Again, he doesn't answer. I climb to my feet and raise my arms defensively, my camera still in my left hand. I know I can't win this fight, but I'm not going to die groveling. My brother wouldn't have wanted that. David still stares at me with his petrified gaze, and I'm not going to let him see me give up. My skin grows bright red for a moment, but then starts to darken. It quickly grows black. I recognized the condition immediately. It's frostbite, and it's spreading on my left arm. There's nothing I can do to stop it. I see my arm wither and darken. I'm starting to not be able to feel it at all. The camera in my hand grows so cold that I drop it. It shatters to pieces on the deck, its lens clouded by frost. The picture I took with it couldn't be seen anyway. My arm worsens, growing so numb and losing all feeling completely. The skin on my arm freezes and dies right in front of my eyes, and the boy just keeps grinning. He's enjoying watching me suffer, just like he enjoyed watching the crew suffer. He points right at me and he starts to laugh, but no sound comes out of his mouth. He's just silently pointing and cackling, like my suffering is the funniest thing that he's ever seen. There is no warmth in his grin, just pure sadistic malice. His soundless, hollow mocking continues, and I've never felt worse in my life. My bitter eyelids finally blink and the boy is gone. 
I sat there on the deck with my frozen brother for a long time. My body and mind are completely numb. I don't feel alive anymore. I stare out at the raging seas of the Drake Passage and expect to see the boy still standing there. I never see him again. I turn to David. My tears burn on my freezing face, steam rising from my cheeks. I'm so sorry, David. I'm so sorry we never should have gone out here. We never should have done this. We shouldn't be here. I don't know if he can hear me. I doubt it. I look back out at the water. The boy still isn't there. Something does appear on the horizon, though. Another seagoing vessel. There's hope in this frozen wasteland. I almost can't believe it. Do you see that, David? We're saved. We're getting out of here. My brother never answers. A silhouette moves out at sea. At first, I thought it's the frozen boy. Maybe he's here to hurt more people, to continue his horrible game. It's too small to be him, though. It's a penguin. It's taking a break on a small patch of ice, floating in the sea. I wish I still had my camera. People love pictures of penguins. Years later, I live far away from the sea. I made sure that I chose a home that resides in a perpetually warm climate. I'm here so that I'm never cold again. I need to feel safe, even if it means sweating for the rest of my life. Usually, I try to keep myself practically boiling. I turn the heat in my home up to uncomfortably high degrees, and I never go to places where it isn't hot. It's the only way to live now. However, despite my best efforts, when I look down at the empty space where my frost-bitten arm used to be, I still feel a shiver. When there's even the faintest draft of cold air, I'm suddenly back on the ship in the Drake Passage. The picture I took of the boy on the water might not exist, but I still see it. It's so clear in my mind. I see him standing there. I see the boy standing out on the ice. I see his blue lips curl into his deranged grin. I see him point at me and I feel the touch of his finger on my freezing skin. I have never been able to keep completely warm since my final voyage, and I know I never will. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.